Hi, I'm Mark D. Kennedy. When Troy Casser Daly won four Golden Guitar Awards at the Tamworth Country Music Festival early this year, it was the culmination of a decade-long journey and a lifelong involvement with country music. Here today to talk about his music, his hopes, his aspirations, and his tour is Troy Casser Daly. Welcome. Mark, when I first heard your name, I heard that, you know, Mark Kennedy was doing his interview today. I thought, that must be a drummer that I know. <laughs> a fantastic drummer. In yeah, and to, who's he drum for? Uh... Oh, look, he's drummed, he's drummed on a lot of sessions. He's done session work for me and for Casey and uh, a lot of artists that he's covered, but he's a very musical drummer, and I thought we were going to get mixed up with someone else. Well, I was, I was raised Catholic, so, of course, I'm pretty good with the rhythm method, but that's about it. That's about as far as the rhythm goes, you reckon? <laughs> With the release of Getaway Car, your second single, by the way, I saw it on Sunrise, a fantastic performance. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, that being the second single from Brighter Day, you must be a pretty happy man at the moment. Yeah, look, I'm really happy with the way that um, the single's being received, especially the clip, because um, we, we wanted to shoot it in that timeless format of black and white. Uh, Casey was kind enough to come in and be the ghost in the back of the car as well. We got a great looking old 1968 Monaro to be the feature part of the, the clip. And it was just uh, one of those love stories that involved crime. And, and I wrote it with Don Walker. Um, he, he lived with the song for a while and, and he just loved every aspect of it. But we just made some subtle changes together over the phone and, and then here came the song. What's it like writing with people like Don Walker? Well, look, Don always gives me this big rap of saying that I bring all these things 99% complete, but he's, he's, he's lying through his teeth, I can tell you now. He, I, he adds stuff to these songs that is really special and adds an, an element of, of, of realism, I think, because with, with Getaway Car, there were a few lines that he just twisted a little bit more just to sound real. He had this scanner, you know, a lot of people in a car in a getaway car will have a radio that scans the police radio so you know whether they're onto you when you've pulled, pulled off a job. And he, he came up with those lines, hear him calling on the radio and stuff like that. And it just gave it that little bit of an edge. And I actually thought Don had been involved in crime at some time to know such a realistic thing. But he just, he has really good uh, fly on the wall perspective with his writing. Nice shooting it in black and white as well. Yeah, and especially with film. Um, I haven't done one where we've shot with film for quite a while. And normally it's like an, an aspect of uh, making clips that no one bothers with anymore unless you're spending a hundred thousand bucks but we thought we'd go to the extra trouble it, it looks grainy it looks like it's um it will hopefully hold up in the next 10 years as a clip we can be proud of people see something like that just turn up on their screen don't really think about the money involved what sort of cost is there involved in putting a video like that together oh look that can range from like 15 grand through to 50 for ones you make locally here but i mean i'm really happy with the way that look emi as a label said look we want to make this a beautiful clip it's a it's a really touching story um, it's a it's a love story and, it, and it's got a bit of drama in it and it deserved to be like a mini movie and, and i was really chuffed when they said that because um i had that in mind and so did don when we first wrote the song and i initially wrote the song for casey that's where her involvement you know sort of made sense um, i told her that i you know i'd written the song for her she needed some b-sides for an album she made and I was just a bit too stupid to be able to burn a CD from the system that I'd recorded it on. And it sat on this system for about a year. And then I finally put it in the mix of stuff for Nash. And Nash, um, he said to me, he said, where have you been hiding this getaway song? And I said, it's been on this ADAT machine that I didn't know how to use. So um, we decided to put it in the mix for the record and suddenly it's a single. So it's got a long history, this tune. And it's a great video clip. So let's take a look at it right now. It's at the end of a lonesome day The sun is finally hidden its face away You taught me everything I know In a getaway car on the northern Get away car 
on the final run Get away car so sleek and black It's a very good video. DVD's a huge part now of the marketing success of music today. Do you enjoy the process of making videos? Yeah, look, I do. I mean, look, I enjoy every aspect of music. A lot of people, you know, they don't like the studio or they mightn't like the touring or they mightn't like making film clips or doing publicity, for instance. I actually really enjoy anything to do with music, whether it's talking about it, whether it's sitting down making it, pressing a red button at home and recording things myself, I get a big kick out of because it's a part of your creativity, you know? Do you remember the first time you ever heard one of your records on the radio? Yeah, I do. I was actually um, I was, I was driving, I think, between Coffs Harbour and Grafton, and I heard a song called Proud Young Man on the radio on a local little community station, and mate, I nearly pulled over and cried. It was like one of the most amazing things to hear. And I remember getting home, we didn't have mobile phones in those days, and I remember getting home and telling my mother about it and how proud she was, because we had sent these things out, you know, to all these little tiny community stations to play and um, when you send them out single-handedly with your mum and it's your first single it's it's it makes you realize how important that the independent scene is I guess. Your mum Irene had a huge influence on your early appreciation of country music what are some of your earliest memories of those times? Look mainly with mum I think it was first of all um, her good taste in music and second of all you know being able to to have just that little amount of money left to buy an LP, you know, which was a big kick for us. And whether it was Willie Nelson or Slim Dusty or Johnny Cash, um, she always came home with something in this beautiful little, it used to be this, this store in Grafton called Nash Villa. And it was a little Nash Villa bag. And I always knew when we had that orange bag, we had a record. And couldn't wait to get home and put it on the turntable and just listen to someone like George Jones or Willie Nelson sing. And, um, and they ended up becoming mentors of mine. 
and you don't realise that at the time. All you're thinking at the time is that, hey, my mum likes country music and I love it too because it makes me feel good or tells your story. But they became singing teachers, they became, you know, sometimes a shoulder to cry on, which is what music's all about. Brighter Day is very much a back to your roots trip for you, isn't it? Uh, back to your hometown of Grafton. Tell me about the process of writing the album. Yeah, well, it was a different process. I, I needed a little bit more time to write this record because it was um, there's some stories in there that needed stripping back. And also um, getting to the core of the stories was the most important part. So I spent a few, few hours on the road getting back home to Grafton, sitting on the veranda at my mum's place, which is still a beautiful place. I pull up to the gate and get completely inspired you know, searching for the key, and it's the same gate that I used to come and go out as a kid. And um, when, you, when, you, when you go through it, it's almost like going into another zone of your life that you'd forgotten about. And it dug up a whole lot of stuff that I, I didn't realise was there again. And you can get really sheltered from all that, unless you go back and revisit it. So I spent, you know, quite a few afternoons with my mum sitting on the veranda with the guitar, telling stories, um, just reminiscing a bit. And that's where Brighter Day pretty well came, came about from those stories, from those experiences that we'd had. And also the feeling of being home. It's a liberating feeling to be in your own house where you grew up and you, you brought your first girlfriend to meet your mother, you know, all that stuff. And it was pretty interesting for me. Didn't see anything about the Jacaranda Festival. Couldn't, looking amongst the lyrics, you know. <laughs> There's a, a song on here called Time is a Friend of Mine, which does touch on the Crown Hotel <laughs> and, and the people that we... Up against we, the wall where you met the yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was definitely Jacarina Festival time. Uh -huh. Wild times and incredibly fun. I mean, just, just looking back at your youth, um, this is a chance through music to be able to, to touch base with that again. Because I had a great youth growing up in Grafton. It was just, a, I felt blessed to grow up in such a beautiful town. And I, I, I had some incredible experiences that I'll never forget. And I keep utilising I suppose the experiences that I had in my in my records no matter what record I'm making there's always some sort of a touch or reference back to Grafton. Let's track through the album right now Going Back Home tell me about that one track one. Yeah Going Back Home um, I had an uncle that passed away who was like my father figure at home in Grafton I was living in Sydney uh, I packed up my EH it, it overheated three times going up the highway and um, it was the thinking time that I had while that car cooled down which pretty well forged the, the, the memory of that song. I didn't have the heart to get rid of it, but it was the first time that it played up really, but it was a good time because I was in a bit of a hurry to get back. It was almost like someone telling me, it might have been my Uncle Jerry, just sort of saying, just slow down and think about what you're doing. And it's exactly what going back home is all about. So what are you driving now? I'm driving a Holden still. <laughs> it's a lot newer and it's got um, air conditioning, which the other one didn't, so it's great. Lonesome but free. I had an uncle uh, that I never got to meet. Um, I was 18 months old when I touched his hands through the bars at Long Bay Jail here. Um, he'd been in, in trouble uh, back home in Grafton, he got put into jail here, he got out um, on bail. He was pretty well, you know, never spoken about much in our family because he had a big falling out with my grandfather who was his dad. Um, they originally thought that he'd hang around Grafton, he came back to Sydney and tried living down here, couldn't see his kids and they found him, um, he'd committed suicide down here in a, in a lonely little flat somewhere in Sydney. And um, I thought of you know, his life through, through his eyes and what it would have been like not to be able to go home. There's, there's lines in this particular song I wrote with Paul Kelly, I explained the story to him. And he said, um, and, and what about the wheat fields and stuff he would have seen while he was out on the road? Um, and, and the work that had to be done, not only you know, on the wheat fields or whatever we were talking about, but on the relationship with his dad. And um, it was special to be able to win a golden guitar for song of the year for that this year, just, just for the sake of my uncle. You mentioned your grandfather. Did he work on the railways, didn't he? He did, yeah. Um, he you know, had this fantastic little house at, at, uh, at South Grafton. It was a little commission home, like a railway commission home. And they paid it off and he retired you know, as a, as a hard working bloke, very much a blue collar fella. What did he do? He was an assistant section man, they called it like a fettler. And he, he just had such a great work ethic. It, it, it drifted down to a lot of us kids. We watched him work and watched him uh, struggle for acceptance in, in his community too as a, as a hard working person. And, and he won a lot of respect through that. And I think you can learn a lot from that sort of thing. I wonder if that's a job that even exists anymore. My grandfather was a wheel tapper. Well, there you go. I mean, there are a lot of jobs now. I've spoke to a lot of crews that I run into at motels when I'm on tour that are working on railway lines. And things have got a lot more high tech now, Mark, I tell you. But it's amazing to think that these people are still out there in the heat of the day and um, Western Queensland all got the orange vests on and doing the job. And, and I talk to them sometimes in the, in the evenings and just reminisce about what, what their fathers, they're, they're all second, third generation railway workers, which I think is awesome.